All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, hanging out with the side scan in the side scan room. Um, and I'm just going to quickly introduce Pete Ramsey, who is uh, uh, here on behalf of Klein, and he's going to be going over a, um, a presentation he has prepared for us uh, in lieu of the, the the stream demo that he didn't want to run in this wonderful weather outside. Uh, all right, take it away. Thanks, Daniel, and hi, everybody. I hope it's been a good conference for you. Um, as Daniel mentioned, uh, my name's Pete Ramsey. I'm the Director of Strategic Hydrographic Programs at uh, Klein Marine Systems. And uh, what I'd like to tell you as well, the little comment I've got at the bottom, everything we're doing here at the HIPAC conference is what we call hydrospatial. If you guys haven't had a look at, at what hydrospatial is, um, go have a look on LinkedIn. There's a very nice hydrospatial group that uh, consider joining it. It's a really good group of people, and it's pretty much uh, like-minded folks who, who are doing the same sort of work that we're doing. So have a look at it if you get a chance. Right, so what I'm going to talk to you about is understanding side scan sonar technology and how to meet survey compliance. Now, this is becoming a bit of a tricky business at the moment. Um, we, we're getting survey contracts which are getting stricter and stricter in terms of object detection. I'm going to demystify it for you, show you how to do your own calculations and how to work out whether you're going to meet compliance or not. Uh, not too much math. I've tried to reduce it as much as I possibly can, but uh, we'll talk about the technology. And it won't only be client systems. We're going to talk about other manufacturers too. So let's have a look. So what I'm going to cover here is basically an introduction to side scan sonar technology. We're going to have a look at the um, different types of side scan sonar. The traditional ones that you used to are called real aperture sonars. And we're also going to talk about synthetic aperture sonars. Uh, single beams are more the systems that you're used to, you know, the clients, the marine sonics, the edge techs, those are single beams, and they're generally used for survey and search and recovery. And then I'm going to talk to you about the multi-beam side scans. Now, this is not a multi-beam echo sounder, MBES. This is an MBSS, multi-beam side scan sonar. And these are, you know, high speed, high resolution, military and very high specification survey sonars. And then I'm going to evaluate survey specifications, and I'm going to choose uh, three survey specifications to evaluate, ones that are going to be pertinent to you guys for your operations. And we're going to look at how we can actually, um, you know, meet these specifications with different types of sonars, and then we'll have a few concluding remarks. So I don't know if any of you know, probably most of you do, what does sonar actually mean? Well, it's an acronym, sound, navigation, and ranging. That's what sonar actually means. So a side scan sonar is a different type of sonar, and it emits um, a fan-shaped beam. And if you have a look at this side scan over here, um, this is what, the vert what we call the vertical beam width. It's a very wide beam, 50, 60 degrees in a vertical sense. The horizontal beam that comes out of it is very narrow, and uh, that's what allows us to, to get the range and the resolution out of it. So as I mentioned, we've got two basic types of side scan, the RAS, real aperture sonars, and the synthetic aperture sonars. So one thing that's quite important um, in understanding side scan sonar technology is something called a beam pattern. So if you have a look at this example here, here's a transducer face, and the acoustic um, transmission is, the acoustic transmission and receive is coming out of the array at 90 degrees, approximately 90 degrees. And if you have a look, there's the, the transmit. Have a look at these. Um, these are what we call side lobes here. So there's the main lobe of the beam, and we can see a little side lobe on this side and a little side lobe on that side. And that's what typical transducers used to look like, you know, for most manufacturers and still do for that matter. What happens when you've got a side lobe like this is look at the data. So the side lobe is actually interfering with um, the, the data. And look at it here. You see these stripes? So that's the effect of a side lobe. It's causing an anomaly in the data. Now, if you have a critical target, let's say it's in this particular area, and you've got a whole bunch of side lobes, and you're looking for a critical target like a mine or a boulder or something pretty small, you're going to miss it. It's going to be hidden in the side lobe. So that is, this is typical for a, a this is a 1.8 kilohertz non-client sonar. You have a look at a client beam pattern, and you might think I'm fooling you here. There's the transducer face. Uh, that's the 90 degrees. That is the receive 
beam pattern that you can see there. It's almost perfect. You'd think that this was done in a model in MATLAB. No, this is actually measured in our acoustic test tank. These beams are as near to perfect as you can get. Now you have a look at, um, at the data here. Here's the, the nadir area, so this is closest to the towfish, going all the way to the edge of the range. Notice none of that banding because you have a near perfect beam pattern. You can see absolutely everything there is to see on the bottom. Uh, these are lobster traps. This is a piece of rope here. You can see there's a, a little Boston whaler. If you look closely, you can see the outboard engine over there. And that comes from something called a perfect beam pattern. So again, look, you know, if you're choosing a sonar, you need to choose a sonar with a very good beam pattern. Now, frequency is another thing that you need to, to have a look at. Frequency often detects the range of the sonar. So if you're running with a 100 kilohertz sonar, you know, you can expect about you know, 500 meter typical range and 1,000 meters of swath. If you're running a 455 kilohertz or 500, you can't expect more than about 150 meters per side. And if you go up to what, we, what I call the megahertz sonars, you know, the 1.5, 1.6 um, kilohertz sonar, 1.5, 1.6 megahertz sonars, you're looking at about a maximum of, of 30 meter range from these systems. So it's going to give you 60 meters of swath. Now, obviously, the range is going to vary with the temperature, the water, salinity, turbidity, and whether there's any ambient acoustic noise in the, in the water. This is a typical example of 800 meters of swath uh, with a 100 kilohertz system. And here we have a 50 meter swath with um, what we call a focused 900 kilohertz. You'll hear that um, Klein talks a lot about focus transducers. We don't go into the megahertz uh, frequencies, but what we do is we, um, we, we bend the receiver ray slightly and we get that type of resolution without using the super high frequencies. So our focused um, 900 kilohertz gives you the equivalent of 1.5 megahertz sonar. So that's a classic example of a, a long range, you know, low frequency system, high frequency short range system. So that's essentially how frequency affects range. Another thing that, um, you know, affects your data is the range versus the ping rate. Now, if you're on a short range scale and uh, you're going along fairly slowly, this is what your ping rate's going to look like. So if you've got a, a tire sitting on the seafloor and this tire's actually sticking upright, you're getting lots and lots of pings on it. And on this particular tire, I can count three pings that are actually directly intersecting that tire. And if you have a look at the data here, there's the tire. You can see the acoustic um, transmission going right through the tire. You can see it beautifully. Now here I've set the sonar on a longer range and or I'm going slightly faster. Now we've, we haven't really missed the tire, but we haven't insonified it properly. So here we've got you know, gaps between it. We can see it, we can see it in the side of the beams and it gives you a little blob in the record. So that's the difference in, um, in range versus ping rate. So let's say you're doing a NOAA survey. Um, what you need to do is look at the ping rate of the sonar. Now, the ping rate of sonar is going to change from manufacturer to manufacturer. The way we do it at Klein is we use this uh, factor of 600. So we take 600 divided by the range is going to give you your ping rate. So let's say you're doing a NOAA survey. You're operating at 75-meter range, and um, that's, you, you take um, 600 divided by 75, that gives you a ping rate of eight times per second. So the sonar is pinging eight times a second. Now, let's say Noah have said to you that you have to detect um, a one meter object with three pings. So you put this into the spreadsheet here, three pings, and it tells you there that you can go 5.18 knots and you'll get three pings on that target. Okay, so this is, this is not using proper sonar theory. This is using a throwback from multi-beams. It doesn't 100% apply to side scans, but it is used a lot in specifications. Now, let's say you were doing a wind farm, and they're asking you to pick up a 30-centimeter object. So I'm, I've got a, a 0.3-meter object, and I've got to get three pings on it. And if I want to go at four knots, which is there, I have to run it on a 30-meter range scale. So again, the range scale that you are setting is going to determine your ping rate, which also determines your object detection to a point. Okay, we call this sonar lies. So it's one of the ways of doing it, but that, that's ping rate, and you'll see that a lot in, in specifications. But the more important thing to, to consider is the a long track and a cross track um, direct resolution from the sonar. So here's the sonar going along, and this is a marine sonic sonar, and this is the across 
track resolution. So that's going from the nadir area to the far field. And there are standard ways of calculating this and slightly different ways of calculating it. Um, manufacturers do it slightly differently, but essentially we come up with a very, very similar answer. So in the instance of Klein, um, we, we actually use um, our sample rate and, um, and the speed of sound in water divided by two. So if we are using frequencies in the range of you know, 100 to 600 kilohertz, we have a cross-track resolution going across this track like that of 2.4 centimeters. If I'm using one of my very high resolution systems, 900 kilohertz, uh, that has a different sampling rate. So we can get the cross-track direction to 1.2 centimeters. Now, cross-track resolution is, is easy to get. That, that's the easy part, and it will meet most specifications. You know, if you did one to two centimeters, that, that's plenty big enough to, to pick up most objects. The one that's difficult to meet is the along track resolution, and this is what shoots you in the foot when you're trying to do object detection. So the sonar is going along here, and this is the along track resolution, so going along the track of the, the, the sonar. Now, there are a couple of different formulas to calculate it. The easiest one for you guys to use is knowing the beam width of the sonar. And you can find that from any manufacturer spec sheet. And, if, and most manufacturers for the same frequency have very, very similar beam widths because it's physics. So here is our 4K survey straightforward 600 kilohertz system. And that has a beam width, which is the horizontal beam width of 0 0.3 degrees. Now you'll notice how much tighter side scan beam widths are than multi-beams. I mean, a good multi-beam system will be a sort of, you know, let's say half degree by one degree system. Um, side scan gets a lot better resolution than that. So if we take that, that formula that I've got here, sine of theta, theta is the beam width, multiply it by the range and multiply it by 100 to give you um, centimeters. So again, at uh, let's say at 50 meter range scale with a 0.3 degree beam, this is my along track resolution or footprint. It's 26 centimeters. Okay, so in, there's a second formula that you can use, which is the beam width divided by 57 multiplied by the range multiplied by 100. Gives you essentially the same answer within a few decimal points. So two different ways of doing it. For you guys, I would recommend the first way, really easy to do. You can use the manufacturer specification and you can calculate it uh, yourself. Right, so another couple of things that you need to consider when you're looking at resolution and object detection. Now, besides the number of pings on things, which is the easy part, uh, as I mentioned, a long track resolution is king, and that is determined by the horizontal beam width of the sonar, the frequency, and the array length and design. A cross track resolution is more bandwidth and sampling dependent, and uh, that doesn't really change much between the manufacturers. And in comparison between EdgeTech and Marine Sonic and Klein, we all within you know a couple of fractions of a degree of each other. Object detection specifications by NOAA and IHO and a whole lot of other groups require that an object be insonified by three pings. Now, this is a throwback from the multi-beams. You can see an object with a single ping on a side scan. Make no bones about it, you can. But because of the multi-beam folks, we get a little bit penalized, and they want three pings on it. So on a single-beam side scan, which are the more simple side scans that the average um, surveyor would have, you know, this is determined by the scan range, as I showed you in the previous spreadsheet, which determines the ping rate and the survey speed to be able to meet the specification. And we covered that in the spreadsheet a little bit earlier on. Uh, but we have multi-beam sonar systems, which are MBSS systems, which can meet the most stringent survey specifications, and they can go up to 12 knots. Now, just in terms of um, a long track resolution and horizontal beam widths, one of the factors that one of the factors, not the only factor that actually um, qualifies this is the length, the physical length of the array. If you look at the, this model of a side scan here, here I have a short array, and a short array will generally give you a wider beam width. And that wider beam width gives you very good near field data, but it gets a little bit smudgy on the, in the far field. If you have a very long transducer array, and I'm talking with a single beam system in the order of you know, 60 centimeters long, that is going to give you very poor resolution in the near field, but it's going to give you very nice resolution in the far field. So you can see it's a trade-off. You don't want to make a very short array. You don't want to make a very long array either. It's always a trade-off. And um, 
that, that's a basic, very, very basic uh, side to, you know, how your horizontal beam width is determined. All right, so let's have a look at the different types of side scan sonars, and we're gonna concentrate on the single beams. We're gonna talk about a single beam. There's the side scan. It's a single transmit pulse and a single receive beam, and that's what we call a single beam. Yeah? Is it your rate set by the manufacturer? Yes, it is, yeah. You, you have no control over that. So the manufacturer controls everything. The manufacturer controls the array length, uh, the beam width, the frequency, all of that. You, you can't change that in side scans. So frequency is important. Um, we still get uh, single frequency sonars. They are less and less common these days. Um, but generally, we get dual frequency sonars that are produced by ourselves, EdgeTech, Marine Sonic, Geoacoustic, CMAX, and a whole bunch of other manufacturers. The sort of common frequency pairs that you're seeing are the you know, 100, 500 kilohertz. Uh, 300, 600 is a very, very common um, frequency pair, especially for wind farms. Then Klein has come up with this Focus 600, Focus 900, which is, um, you know, we, we're using lower frequencies to get higher frequency results. And then EdgeTech do a very nice uh, 600, 1.6, um, sorry, 600 kilohertz and 1.6 megahertz sonar. And then Marine Sonic do a very neat system, which is a 900 kilohertz, 1.8 megahertz sonar. But don't think you can operate megahertz sonars in the open ocean. They are very, very sensitive to motion. They work great in harbors and calm environments, but if you're gonna go bounce around in the open ocean, don't expect your megahertz sonar to give you very, very good results. Um, EdgeTech have also produced a very innovative system um, called the Tri-Frequency System, and this is called the 4205. And um, you, you can select either this particular model, which has 120, 410, and 850 kilohertz frequencies. So you see that it's three frequencies there, but you can't run them all simultaneously. So you can choose any two of those three. So you can run it as a 120 and an 850 kilohertz system. Or you can choose this model here, which has got 230, 540, and 850. And again, you can only choose two of those frequencies at the same time. But it's a very innovative concept and it's doing well in the market. Then we have a slightly different type of what I still call the, I still classify it as a halfway between a single beam and a multi-beam system. This is a multi-pulse sonar. So it doesn't just send out a single pulse, it sends out two pulses, but it has a single receive beam. And this is dominantly produced by EdgeTech. It's, it's um, something that they've really gone into. And it's a dual frequency system. But just have a look at, just be careful of this. As I said, there's no free lunches in this game. So if we take, if you're operating their system at 850 kilohertz, you've got a 0 0.23 degree horizontal beam width. But the minute you switch it onto multi-pulse, so if you're firing two <coughs> pulses, notice the beam width drops down to 0 0.33 degrees. So essentially, the minute you switch on multi-pulse, you've decreased your horizontal beam width by about 30%, which means that your object detection is far worse. Um, EdgeTech's numbers down here are not um, mathematically correct, but um, I'll give you the correct ones a little bit further on in this presentation. But that's the thing, there's no free lunches with us. So yes, you can get two pings on that object, but you've increased your horizontal beam width, which has decreased your resolution. So you know, you've got to be careful with these things. So that, that is the multi-pulse sonar. And then you get into you know, the, the true multi-beam side scan sonars. And they, we call them MBSS or MAS. MAS is multi-aspect sonar. And you know, these, these are sonars which utilize dynamic focusing, dynamic aperture, they're very high-speed sonars, they're ultra-high resolution, and they have, this, they have the ability to operate in marginal sea states. I mean, we've operated these systems in sea state five and still found mines 120 meters away. So they are able to operate in bad sea conditions. So if you have a look here, we've got a you know, single transmit ping, um, but what we can do is using dynamic focusing and dynamic aperture, we can receive that single ping on 20 different receivers. So we can basically beam form 20 different receive beams um, for these systems. This is Klein's flagship here, which is the Klein 5900. And this is a very good system actually produced by the Wavefront, which is um, you know, part of the, the Sonodyne group. It's called the Solstice. And uh, this is um, a multi-aperture or multi-beam side scan sonar. Um, in terms of the client product range, uh, we have the venerable 5000 V2, 
455 kilohertz dynamically focused system. Look at the horizontal beam width here, 0 0.14 degrees. If you had a 500 kilohertz single beam, you'd be looking at 0.4 to 0.5 degree beam width. This is orders of magnitude tighter and therefore, you know, better resolution. You can also tow it at five knots and you're getting five beams per ping. The real flagship is this system, which is the, uh, the 5900. And this has dynamically focused uh, 650 kilohertz uh, side looking side scan. It has a Nader gap filler, which is um, 750 kilohertz, fired at the same time. Um, it's got a four channel um, interferometer bathymetry system and it's got near Nader imaging as well. So there's four sonars firing simultaneously on the system. Um, generates up to 20 beams per ping and you can tow it at 12 knots. And I'll show you some of the data too, it's pretty cool. Now, into the last type of side scan, which is the, all of those previous ones are what I call the RAS systems, real aperture sonars. We now get into the synthetic aperture sonars. And these are mainly used in the military industry. So, so side scan, the synthetic aperture side scans basically uh, overcome the array length limitations because they synthesize the synthetic aperture over numerous pings. And the resolution is no longer a frequency um, related to the array length. And because the array length is not an issue, you can use lower frequencies too. So in this example here, that is my array length. And here I'm synthetic, so that's the array length, that's the physical aperture that I have. And here I've taken four successive pings, created a synthetic aperture. And the synthetic aperture is dictated by, you know, the, the um, sub-element array size. And if you want to work out what the resolution is, it's about half the sub-element size. So these things are amazing in terms of the range that they can get and the resolution. And it's an isometric resolution where the long track and the cross track resolution are the same. So here, here's a system that, um, that we have in prototype at the moment. Um, it's in production next year in 2026. It's the Klein Saab uh, SAS system, 150 kilohertz, um, two by two centimeter resolution, uh, 200 meter range, and just show you this example. Here, here's an example of two lines of data. And I'm going to go zoom in on this area over here. This is a one by one meter frame. Okay, Inside that frame are five centimeter size spheres. You, you see how many points we actually have on each of those five centimeter spheres. Those things are, are that size. And you're able to detect them at 200 meter range, which is very, very impressive. But again, the, these are systems costing millions of dollars. So. Again, it's, uh, it's not for the average surveyor, but it's, it's used a lot um, in the market, in the military market mainly. And examples, um, companies that produce really good SAS systems are Kraken, Konsberg, Ica, Klein is producing their own system, um, Atlas, Exhale have a system as well. So there's various manufacturers that produce them. Then they're also the big military systems, which uh, most of them are classified. So that's synthetic aperture, different type of sonar. You've heard me mention a little bit about uh, focused transducer technology. So now we're getting on to the third part of my presentation, which is the advanced single beam uh, technology that uh, various manufacturers offer. So I've mentioned focused transducer technology, and this allows us to do critical object detection. So what this actually does is that if you want to do critical object detection, normally you use very, very high frequency sonars, but very high frequency sonars don't transmit you know, very far. They, they get like 20 or 30 meter range. So what we've done is we're using slightly lower, slightly lower frequency systems, but we are actually focusing the array. So we'll take um, a 600 kilohertz system, we'll focus the array, and that gives us the same resolution as a competitor's 900 kilohertz system. But we have the advantage that we can get one third greater operational range, and they're also more motion tolerant. Remember me saying, try and use a megahertz sonar in an offshore environment and you're not going to do too well. They're very, very motion sensitive. So the way we've done it in Klein is we've done it, we've backed down on the frequency, but actually changed the resolution by mechanical focusing. So that, that's worked out pretty well for us. And just to show you the, um, what this actually does, you know, we, I'm talking and you might say, well, Pete doesn't really know what he's talking about. Well, here's some real data. So this is a typical 600 kilohertz sonar. This is not focused. 
and look at the horizontal beam width, 0.3 degrees. Now we're going to take that same transducer, the same frequency, and we're going to focus it. So now we've dropped the horizontal beam width down by, you know, down to 0 0.23 degrees. And uh, this, oops, let's just, I think I've got the wrong slide there. No, I've got the right slide there. Okay. So you can see the improvement in the resolution. So look, look at this uh, clump of rocks over here. You can see how much sharper they are. Uh, this is a cable going across the seafloor that's as thick as two of my fingers. You can see how much better the resolution is over here. So here we've taken the same frequency, so it's got the same acoustic transmission, and, but we've just um, focused it, and you can see the jump in resolution. So again, if we take um, a Focus 600 system, which is equivalent to, again, a 900 kilohertz sonar, and we then compare it to a 900 kilohertz focus, which is more similar to a 1.5 megahertz sonar, you can see even though the horizontal beam width is exactly the same with these, there's a bandwidth change. Um, so we, we're actually able to increase the bandwidth substantially between um, this particular frequency and this particular frequency, and you can see how much better that these um, sand waves are resolved and see how much sharper that this imagery actually is. All right, so what this has also allowed us to do with our focus technology is to do mine countermeasures at short ranges and slow speed. So this is work that we've done with NSWC. Um, this is an interesting uh, little mine-like object. So it's a, it's a steel pipe with one-inch flanges on it. You can see the flanges quite nicely. This is quite interesting. This is a Mark 52 mine. Uh, you can see these two attachment points here. There they are. They're the size of my fist. The guys, here we are running at 40 meter range, 80 meters of swath, running at three knots, and we can see an object the size of my fist. That's pretty impressive. Again, um, here's uh, other types of mines. This is quite interesting. This is a 44 gallon drum. It's got a small little um, pipe on top of it, and you see the pipe quite nicely. You see the acoustic shadow. So again, this focus transducer technology actually does work, and this is done offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. Some other advanced single beam uh, transducer technology is, um, this is actually, gap filling is actually done essentially by two companies at the moment. Uh, Klein actually did the patent for um, sonar gap filling. Um, EdgeTech have done a gap filler, but using a different type of technology. Uh, we are able to to maximize our resolution with our type of technology because it's a true um, side scan sonar. So this is the one that we're actually displaying on the booth at the moment. It's called the MaxView 600. So it has these flippers which stick out, which infill the sonar nadir gap. So now you don't need to go do 200% coverage when you're doing a survey. You can save about 60% of your vessel time because as you're going along here, it's actually infilling the nadir at the same time. So just to show you an example of that, here we've got a, a traditional side scan, and this would be scanning out this way and this way. This is a 50 meter range. We have the native gap fill imagery over here, and in the gap fill, we've actually picked up you know, these three mine-like objects. Now we've physically stitched them into the normal side scan sonar data, so now you can see them. This is done in our spectral AI software, which I'll be presenting at four o'clock uh, this afternoon. And they're zooming in on what these uh, mine-like objects actually look like. So there is a seamless um, focus 600 kilohertz image and 850 kilohertz uh, native gap fill. Right, another very important thing to look at is um, motion tolerant arrays. You know, a lot of us are working in the ocean. It's not a stable environment. And the way we used to build arrays is that we used to have the transmit and receive arrays made the same length. And that essentially is a not a motion tolerant array. So EdgeTech came up with um, a, a way to do motion tolerance and Klein had their own way of actually doing it as well. The way Klein did it is that we actually changed the length ratio between the transmit and receive arrays, which makes our arrays motion tolerant with no change in the horizontal beam width. EdgeTech went a little bit differently. Um, they basically um, increased the horizontal beam width by increasing the receive array length and um, that's how they do their motion tolerance. But if we have a look at the actual numbers, if we run a Klein-focused uh, 600, which is the equivalent of a 900 kilohertz system, let's say we run it at 75 meter range, 0.23 degree beam width, and using our formula of sine theta times the range times 100, that gives you 30 centimeter resolution. So we're gonna run the same EdgeTech system and at 75 meter range, exactly the same 
a horizontal beam width, but theirs is a close to a 900 kilohertz system. And lo and behold, it's gonna give us exactly the same answer. Well, it's physics. But the minute you switch on their motion tolerance, you increase the horizontal beam width to 0 0.33 degrees, and now the resolution gets 13 centimeters worse, or 30% down. That is a disadvantage if you're trying to meet um, object detection specification. And uh, those numbers are directly from EdgeTech's uh, data sheets, but my math. So. Another thing that uh, various manufacturers have tried to tattle over the years is surface reflections. If you're running the towfish fairly close to the surface and you're running it on, um, on long scan ranges, you will see surface reflections. And that comes up here. This is a non-Klein um, data set. And here you can see the side scan scanning over here. This is a surface reflection. So this is multipath. It's the acoustic ray. Instead of coming back to the transducer, it's bouncing off the water surface and then coming to the transducer. You can see the same sort of thing in multi-beams occasionally as well, multi-beam echo sounders. So here we have the surface reflection over here. Now, we found that the best way to actually mitigate this is to use what we call a transducer eyebrow. So we actually manufacture something on the top of the transducer. And what it does is it actually flattens off the horizontal, sorry, the vertical beam width of the sonar. So here we've, this eyebrow over here has actually flattened off the top of this um, acoustic receive beam, which um, mitigates us receiving those multipath beams. Um, which then cleans up the data quite nicely. And this is available on various of our sonar models, specifically the, the 4K survey. So again, um, going into what I called, you know, the in-between, this is the multi-beam systems. They are neither single beams nor, uh, nor true multi-beam side scans. And they, they're quite innovative that they're going to fire two pings at, at the same time, which is going to improve your target detection. But what it's also going to do, as I mentioned in my spreadsheet, is it's going to increase the, um, the vertical, the, sorry, the horizontal beam width of the receiver ray, and it has this effect. So here you can see a fairly nice data over here from a single ping system. The minute you switch on multi-ping, you can see the degradation in the resolution. So again, be careful of using multi-ping systems when you're doing critical object detection. You might think the more pings in the water is better, but remember that you're increasing that horizontal beam width and decreasing your object detection resolution. Right, so why would you want to use a multi-beam system? And here we're gonna talk about the true multi-beam systems. These are very, as I mentioned before, these are high-speed, high-resolution sonars, can generate 20 beams, capable of surveying at you know, 12 knots with no loss in resolution. And uh, Wavefront, Sonodyne uh, make a system, and so does Klein make several of these systems. So here's why you would want to use one. So here we're comparing two different systems, two client systems at 75 meter range. This particular one is the 4K survey, 600 kilohertz, so same frequency, same range, but we're running this at 3.9 knots. This is the object that we're imaging, which is this piece of pipe. And you can see at that range um, and at that speed, this is going really slow, it's under four knots. You can, you can see that object, but you can't see it too well. Now, here, we, here we're taking the same frequency, but it's dynamically focused in our 5900, same range, but now we're running it at eight and a half knots, so we're going more than twice the speed. Look at the resolution difference. Same object, look at the horizontal beam width here. This is 0.3 degrees, this is 0 0.07 degrees. These things are crazy resolution. You know, when you're talking about critical object detection, you can scan a long way and you can find very, very small objects with these systems. So, but you also are going to pay a price as well. These are expensive systems and they, they produce near SAS resolution, but at half the cost of a SAS system. So here's some 5900 imagery and uh, this is stuff Mikhail and I collected. Mikhail, you want to put your hand up over there? There's Mikhail, uh, he's our senior application engineer at Klein. And this is um, data that we collected in the Gulf of Mexico, about four or five miles offshore. And this is running 75 meter range scale, 8.4 knots. Guys, some of your boats don't go 8.4 knots. So here, this is 150 meters of swath. And you can see this beautiful imagery over here. Zooming in on it, you can see this uh, little rock outcrop here. And there's a tire. This tire is imaged at 75 meter range at 8.4 knots is flying along. 
So you can see that that's a tire you know, quite easily. Um, what we also do with our advanced multi-beam technology is we integrate it with a NADA gap filler. And uh, here's a 5900 with a NADA gap filler. That's what a close-up of our NADA gap filler looks like. And here we're running our sonar on 150 meters of range. So it's 300 meters of swath, and the NADA has been infilled at the same time using the, the NADA gap fill system. So you're essentially getting 300 meters of swath, uh, seamless data, and you can do mine countermeasures with the type of resolution that we can get with these systems. Right, so that's in terms of the different side scans. So we've looked at the different types of uh, real aperture sonars, the single beams, the multipole systems, the multi-beams, and we've looked at SAS as well. Now we're gonna try and, we're gonna try and win a survey contract, and we're gonna look at, at uh, survey standards and specifications, and uh, there's some examples from the IHO, NOAA, and NAVO. Right, so we have what I call general specifications, and then we have specific target deter um, detection criteria specifications. So we look at the general ones, and this is all really easy for us to meet. Uh, the customer will tell us, or the specification will tell us that they want a you know, single or dual frequency system, easy. They're telling us they want minimum 500 kilohertz, again, easy. 200% coverage, easy. This is how you want to tow your side scan, you know, 10 to 20% um, altitude of the range, easy. The line spacing, again, easy. They're telling us not to go faster than four to five knots, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is where the difficult part comes in, and this is the specific target detection criteria. Now, this is an example from a wind farm, and let's say we, we need to meet the side scan sonar H specification, and it's asking us to detect a 30 centimeter object. Ooh. This is now getting difficult, okay? And it's saying to us here that we have to have three pings landed on that object in a both along and across track direction. So uh, this is now getting hard. This was all easy. This is the hard part, and we'll see how to get there. All right, so let's have a look at the offshore renewables. And again, the easy part is this, what I call the general specifications. And they're telling you that, you know, they, they don't want a horizontal beam with, you know, um, more than 0.5 degrees, which means essentially anything 500 kilohertz and above is gonna meet that specification. And they're telling you not to be a klutz and don't tow the side scan too close to the bottom or too high off the bottom, and they want 200% coverage. But now they're coming with all these object detection criterias now. If we take this unexploded ordnance one from a UX wind farm, they're saying to you they, you, they want you to find a 30 centimeter piece of unexploded ordnance and that's the frequencies that you need to use. You need to use a ping rate of more than 20, almost 22 pings a second. Wow, this is getting tough now. And they want you to be able to position that object wherever it is on the seafloor within two meters. This is getting tough. Okay. So again, they've, they've got this multi-beam centric view of the world where you have to have three pings on that particular object. And now what they're saying to you is you've got to tow two side scans at the same time because a single normal single beam side scan doesn't have the ping rate and the survey speed, like let's say running at four knots, to be able to insonify a 30 centimeter target with three pings on it. So they want you to tow two side scans out the back. Now they're making your job really hard. So let's see how we can actually do this, how we can respond to that. So we, again, we were talking about the US offshore wind market, and let's go look at this UXO one. So I, I did all these calculations for you, and um, you know, if, you need, uh, if you need help with any of this stuff, we can provide our, our manual on how to actually do this. So we can use only two of our sonars meet the specifications, two of our single beams, and that is the 4K UHR, which is the ultra resolution one, and the max view. And we can run these at about you know, almost the 22 pings per second, um, we would have to run it at 30 meter range, which is going to give us, you know, 12 centimeter resolution, and we we can detect that object pretty well if we go four knots, just over, just under four knots, like 3.9 knots, and we can do that. But again, 3.9 knots is pretty tough to meet all the time. I mean, sometimes the vessel might go a little bit faster, might go up to five knots, and you automatically become non-compliant. Right, if we use a multi-beam system, so say, or you use one of the, um, the, the Sonodyne Solstice systems, which is again a multi-aperture system, 
So any of these systems here, you can run them at 50 or 75 meter range, you get 10 centimeter resolution. You can pick up that 30 centimeter object at 10 knots, guys. 10 knots at 75 meter range. Again, using our flagship 5900, you can run that at 75 meter range, you're gonna get nine centimeter resolution, and you can, do, you can go up to 12 knots and you will pick up those objects. So again, this is the way that a lot of the wind farms are going now. Uh, we're starting to sell a lot of our multi-beams into the wind farm market because it's so tough to use a standard single beam from Klein or Edgetech or Marine Sonic to meet these wind farm specifications. And you think they're strict now. We've been talking to a couple of wind farm operators and they're gonna get more strict. So again, you know, it's gonna make um, surveyor's life a bit of a nightmare. So again, you know, if you're going to do these wind farm jobs, you've got to use a very high frequency sonar, you've got to run it on a short range, and you've got to go slowly, otherwise you're never going to see these objects. Or otherwise, invest in a multi-beam or multi-aperture system, and you can see these things at high speed and long range. Let's go to NOAA. NOAA is nowhere near as strict as, as the wind farm ones. And again, just in terms of the general easy to, to meet specifications, NOAA wants you to do you know, either 100 or 200% coverage. They say to you, you can use a single or dual frequency sonar, they don't care, but they want you to detect this one meter cube object and you've got to insonify it with three pings. Okay, that's pretty easy. And they're fairly strict about how you should tow the, the side scan off the bottom. And they don't want you to use more than 100 meter range scale. Most NOAA contract surveys are done at 75 meter range. So again, that's pretty easy. So again, here is an example of meeting NOAA. So we're gonna run our sonars on 75 meter range, which is gonna give us eight pings a second. And we can survey at five knots and we can find any one meter object. We get three pings on it with any one of client systems or any one of edge tech systems, uh, any professional side scan, um, you can meet the requirement. And you can run it at 75 meter range you know, quite easily. Or if you're smart and you've bought a client or a uh, or a solstice uh, multi-beam system, uh, you can run these at 150 meter range and you can go at 10 or 12 knots and you can meet NOAA compliance. Again, you know, it's horses for courses. If you've got the money, you know, invest in the multi-beam system. And the last specification that I'm actually gonna go through is NAVO. Don't know, anybody here do um, mine warfare surveys in the audience? No? So again, here are the, the general specifications. You know, they want you to um, e either use a single frequency or dual frequency system. Um, they want you not to really operate at more than about a 50 meter range scale. And uh, they, they're quite prescriptive about the line spacing and you've got to be able to detect a half meter object. Okay, not, not, not too bad. So again, we'll find that um, you know pretty much any of our single beam systems, any of the, the more higher resolution systems, you can operate them at 50 meter range, which gives you 12 pings per second. And if you go just under four knots, you can meet these specifications. So 50 meter range and just under four knots and you're gonna meet the half meter detection specification. Or you invest in a multi-beam or multi-aperture system and you can run along at 10 knots at 75 meter range or on the 5900, 120 meter range. And you can see those all day, every day. So again, horses for courses, but the multi-beam systems are what you want for critical object detection. Um, this is gonna be on our website fairly soon. We're gonna put this on our website, this table. So this is a table that I actually compiled with pretty much every survey specification in the world going through um, European wind farms, um, US wind farms, right the way down to BOEM, geophysical BOEM, archeological surveys, even down to New Zealand. You know, if you're surveying in New Zealand, this is what you want. And this gives you the, the different client systems and whether they are compliant with the specifications or not. So it's quite a handy little table to have. We will be publishing this on our website um, probably in about March, I'd say, the new website will be out. So again, so that will be available. So the important things to note about this is that if you need to do high speed critical object detections, you have to use a multi aperture or a multi beam side scan. So you're looking at essentially a, you know, a Sonodyne um, wave front solstice system, or you're looking at a Klein multi beam system, which would be either the 5000 V2 or the 5900. If you're gonna go to a higher resolution 
edge tech system or high resolution client system. I'm talking about a high frequency system around about the you know, 900 kilohertz range. You're going to have to run it at 50 meter scan range or less, and you're gonna to have to keep your survey speed between three and four knots, otherwise you're never gonna meet these survey specifications. And sometimes that's tough. Some boats don't steer very well at three knots. So again, uh, that's where the, the multi-beam systems are great. So when you're choosing your side scan, whether it be a Klein or an edge stick or a Marine Sonic, you know, look at the operational speed that you need to do. Look at the scan ranges that you need to run at, your coverage rates. Is NADA coverage requirement um, something that interests you? And also, what is your critical object detection? And this is going to narrow down what single beam or multi-beam system that you're going to need to choose for your application. Questions? Uh, <laughs> I can't imagine any wind keeping anything Yeah, it's, it's, well, the, the, the towfish in full configuration weighs 660 pounds. Okay. Okay, so we, we also run a 0.68 cable, which is fed. Uh, it has a very, very big wing depressor on it. Okay. Uh, we have got a wing depressor system, which has got um, hydraulic actuators on it as well. So okay. you can address the tack angle. Yep. Uh, we're working on a new pro, a new a program for NAVO that we call Block 4, where we're actually able to fly the system. We've got controllable tails. Got okay. So that will be released uh, towards the end of this year. So, yeah, you so can get it done. Yeah. Um, it, it has a 750-meter depth rating. So that's the deepest. Mikhail, what is the deepest you've ever towed a 5,900, or, or that you know that NAVO have? Oh. <coughs> Thousand. Thousand. Yeah, so actually below the depth rating. So yes, you can get it done. Okay. Thank you. Pleasure. But it's a heavy beast. Yeah. When you, you put it off the back of the boat and the cable doesn't go out like that, it goes straight yeah, down. It from yeah. In fact, M Mikhail and I, um, the imagery that you saw there from the 5900, we were operating at eight and a half, nine knots. Um, we were in 20 meters of water and we had 18 meters of cable out, one eight. 18 meters of cable at, out at eight, at eight and a half, nine knots. You don't need to put out a lot of cable. That thing weighs a ton. So it's, yeah. Any, any questions? Does, it, does this help you in terms of getting to your survey specifications and figuring out what technology you need? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry? Um, this is recorded and will be on YouTube. How's that? Great. Yeah. I'm just curious, you were talking about uh, towing two side scans to meet a spec. Who's to say if you were doing that, the spatial and temporal distribution of that data would actually give you twice as much data versus it, two times the It doesn't. Data. It doesn't. But this is where the so stupidity the comes in. And you know the other thing that they say to you is that you the one side scan is not allowed to see the other side scan's cable in the data. It's it's absolutely impossible. And these things get hooked up. You know, the minute you do a turn, they hook up amongst each other. It's a, just a nightmare. You're doing wind farm work, you know, in the US and they're forcing you to use two side scans. It's just not fun. Who set the standards? Uh, in the in the U.S., it was a single individual. Um, I'm not going to mention their names, but uh, yeah, it was a <laughs> yeah. I, I I disagree with the specifications because the specifications are based on a poor knowledge of sonar, but a good knowledge of multi-beam echo sound systems. Thomas, would you agree with me on that statement? Kind of like two things. Correct. And as I said to you, um, with, with a side scan, with a single ping, you can see an object. Yep. Any other questions? Forward. The shadows are at um, almost 45 degrees. So, so that, 
they point forward here. Okay, got so it. It, it requires a little bit of a, a head scratch. I'll, I'll show you, um, just show you the slide. So you've got, whoops, let me go the other way. That's my second talk later on. Um, yeah, so have a look at this. So here, look at the, where the shadow is there. So the shadow is actually forward there, but let, let's say um, it, the object was here, then the shadow would be going off in this direction. If the object was here, the shadow would be going off in this direction. So you've got to get your head around it a little bit because of the sonar incident angle is slightly different to what you're used to with side scan. So. It's 90 degrees different now, right? Uh, no, not necessarily. It's 90 degrees different if the object is directly underneath the towfish. If it's offset slightly, ah. it's at a, at a 45 angle. Again, you've got to get your head around that. It's not hard, but it just looks a little bit different. Any other questions? No questions? Okay, I've got to talk a little bit later on to how to take this sonar data into artificial intelligence and make your life easy. Because we've all been bombarded with so much data now that you just can't cope. So let's, let's look at, uh, that's at 4.15, how artificial intelligence can actually help you with this. So. Same, room. Sa same room, same room, yeah. So um, if, if anybody wants to chat to me privately later, if you've got questions, you don't want to ask in the public forum, if you come to booth uh, 22, uh, come find me. Name's Pete Ramsey. <laughs>